All right. Let's start. Let's start uh, covering material. Also, I realized I think I said something incorrectly. This is week nine, not week eight. I did that yesterday too. We figured it out. This is week nine, which means your presentations are two weeks from Thursday. Not three weeks from Thursday. Are we going to have a Tuesday? It'll be a review session as well for the um, for the final. Mm -hmm. So yes, there that last week we're going to try and get through all the material. I know it's kind of kind of uh, lackadaisical with how fast we're going. We're not going very fast this quarter, um, but I'm, we still have two weeks of new material, and then um, so we'll do a week of semi. This week will be uh, material science, we'll talk about semiconductors day, and then we'll talk about coordination chemistry, which is some of those complex ions. Basically, we'll look at some of the properties of those complex ions um, the, from the KF values on uh, Thursday. And then next week, we'll do a real brief introduction to organic chemistry. Um, and then we'll, that'll be all the new material that we're covering. About two weeks of new material. Uh, a week of review and presentations, and then finals week. So, um, it's uh, the end is coming soon. Almost made it through this whole series. Congratulations. One more big push, and uh, you'll be can't say you some more graduates. You all completed the general character chemistry series, which is not nothing. That's uh, it's a pretty big step. So good job this this year. Uh, let's see. Let's start. This is where we end, where we ended up the other day. We started talking about how different types of solids look, silicates versus um, other, and just sort of these more complicated crystal structures. Um, but let's talk a little bit about what happens to the orbitals when we start plumbing these. So does this figure look similar or familiar at all? We talk about bonding and anti-bonding orbitals. No. We talk about hybridized orbitals, sp2 versus sp3. So that's that is an example of a bonding orbital. Bonding orbital is basically you get these layers of orbitals, kind of these functions sort of stacking on top of each other. If you mix together an S orbital and a P orbital, you get a combination, a hybridized orbital called an sp3 orbital. And if you take an sp3 orbital from one atom and move it up close to an sp3 orbital from another atom, you get a sigma bond. Do you guys talk about bond, pi bonds versus sigma bonds? Yeah. So that's basically taking those two hybridized orbitals and further hybridizing them. Basically, all of these different orbitals are made by mixing together the functions of uh, that make up the different orbital shapes. Um, and and basically, those of you who have had linear algebra, they call this this way of understanding it. They call it the LCAL approach, which stands for linear combination of atomic orbitals. If you think of atomic orbitals, s orbitals, p orbitals, d orbitals, as just these three dimensional functions, really they're four dimensional functions. Um, but it's hard to visualize the fourth dimension. They have a shape that is three-dimensional, and then they kind of have like a bell curve superimposed on that. That's the fourth dimension. It's basically, it's a probability dimension. Um, where if you think about where you're likely to find an electron, it's in this general shape. So a few orbital might have this. Actually, let me take that back. We'll do an S orbital because that's easier to draw. So an S orbital has a general shape that looks like a sphere, right? Um, and in, in that sphere is where you're likely to find an electron. But likely implies probability, right? And so it actually, this, the shape of that, the size of that sphere is actually based on how likely you are to find an electron there. Basically, if, if you, if we say that um, there's a 50% chance the electron is inside this shape, if you want to know, um, if you want it to be a 90% chance that the shape includes the electron, the sphere gets bigger, which kind of makes sense, right? 
that if you've got this randomly moving particle and we're really this, this shape, it's drawn as a solid object, but it's really kind of fuzzy. And how likely you are to find the electron, it's based on how big you make this shape. And so you can kind of think of that as having like a bell curve shape in the shape of a three-dimensional sphere. That's what I mean when I say it's a four-dimensional function, which is all very complicated, hard to visualize, hard to act to wrap your head around what that actually means. Um, but all of, my whole point though is basically just that an S orbital is just a function. It's a mathematical function that represents where you're likely to find an electron, right? Well, mathematical functions can be mixed together. Um, if we remember learning things like g of x is equal to f of x plus h of x. You can mix these functions together as much as you want, right? And so if all electrons exist in these orbitals and all these atomic orbitals are just functions, we can mix them together as much as we want. Um, we just do it like this, where we just normalize it so that we don't have so the overall probability of finding an electron is still a probability of one. So we're mixing a function of S, a, um, f of x plus h of x might be 0 0.5 times f of x plus 0 0.5 times h of x. So that this the coefficients here still add up to one. Um, but with that in mind, all orbitals, all covalent compounds are made up of, of these orbitals just mixed together mathematically. And this is actually pretty, this is a sort of a mathematical abstraction of a way to understand this, but we can actually visualize these orbitals and test this pretty well. Um, and these orbitals, it does behave like this. Reality actually behaves like this, which is weird. This is such a weird, funky mathematical concept. It seems so far removed from reality, but quantum mechanics is weird. So what does all this have to do with what we're talking about here? Well, these bonding orbitals are just a mixture of these hybridized orbitals. Or well, in this case, if we're talking about hydrogen atoms, what's the, what's the um, only occupied orbital in a hydrogen atom? What is it? One. One, one S, right? One S one. I, I heard what you said now. One S one is the electron configuration of a hydrogen atom, right? When you bring two hydrogen atoms together, they'll form a covalent bond. And that bond though doesn't look like an S orbital. It looks like a mixture of two S orbitals. And that's what we call a bonding orbital, where we have these things. If we have this um, one S orbital that's a roughly a sphere shape and another one that's roughly a sphere shape, they can overlap together to make something that looks like this. The electron cloud around these two hydrogen atoms kind of looks like you overlapped two spheres together. You mixed them together. But if we can do that, that only works as long as we can have constructive interference. And the thing about these, these um, orbitals is if we can add them together, um, so if we had 1s plus another 1s, we get something that looks like this, where the, everything is in phase, you get constructive interference, we get this, this shape. But if we can have constructive interference, that also implies what? What's the other type of interference? Close, just destructive. Um, it's destructive because we're not taking it apart. I think a deconstruction would be taking apart something that's already constructed or splitting hairs, I suppose. Um, but destructive inter interference is basically, instead of if we have them adding up, if one of them has the wrong sign, instead of one S plus a one S, you do one S minus a one S you get destructive interference. And that would look like, okay, if we bring, if we try to bring these two together, we use color a lot of times to represent the different phase of these 
um, orbitals because it's kind of like they're positive and negative, but we don't want to use that term because that confuses it in terms of charge. They're still both electrons. So they both still have a negative charge, but the phase is opposite <laughs> inside. And so a lot of times you'll do it where you um, either shade one in and leave the other one unshaded or use two different colors. If you try to get two opposite phase orbitals to overlap with each other, they cancel each other out. And instead of getting something like this, you get them basically repelling each other. And so that's what we call an anti-bonding orbital. A bonding orbital is when you get positive constructive interference between the orbitals and you get something that's more stable than if they were separated. Destructive interference gives you something that's less stable than what you started with. And they call that an anti-bonding orbital. Um, again, just because we don't want to get into using words like positive and negative, but it's, a set, it's effectively the opposite of a bond. Um, and if a bond made things more stable, because now everything can look like it has a full valence by having those covalent electrons. Um, did Carl talk about the, uh, the nature of the word covalent? Something that took me a really long time is that the word covalent doesn't sound like any other word, right? But if you actually, there actually has an etymology to it. Covalent literally means the electrons are in two valences at once, which is really, really obvious. And I'm, I'm always bring it up because I'm kind of embarrassed. It took me 10 years of studying chemistry to realize that that's what that word comes from. So that's why the bonding orbitals make things more stable because you get the same number of electrons, but you can fill two valences at the same time. An anti-bonding orbital, as, as much stabilization as you get by the bonding orbital, an anti-bonding orbital is gonna have the opposite. It's being, gonna be less stable if you actually put electrons into an anti-bonding orbital. And so our rules for how we fill up these orbitals though, we go from the bottom up, right? from the most stable orbitals to the least stable orbitals. And you stop when you run out of electrons, right? And so in an atom like this, or in a molecule like this, we have two electrons, so we fill up the bonding orbital, and then we leave the anti-bonding orbital alone. If you take an electron, this is one of the reasons why UV light breaks things down. If you have a single bond between two atoms, well, now all of a sudden we have these two different energy levels. If you put take electrons from this level and move them up there by shining light on it of the right wavelength, all of a sudden you have just as many anti-bonding electrons as bonding electrons, and the whole thing falls apart. You basically cancel out the bond by doing this. And this is why some compounds break down when you shine UV light on them. And this is why when we were talking about radioactivity last week, we said, okay, well, if you shine, you know, UV light, up, if you shine ionizing radiation on your cells, it generates free radicals. This is exactly why shining the right wavelength of light on water would cause the water to split apart into free radicals. And all we're really doing is moving electrons from a bonding orbital to an anti-bonding orbital. We do that. The same with like plastic in a car. That's like it just yes, it's exactly fire. why, especially up here at altitude, um, our plastics in our cars, plastics in general, don't handle the radiation up here as well as a sea level. We have a much more intense sunlight up here, right? And plastics get brittle. The more you shine UV light, ionizing radiation, especially on plastics, they tend to age. And that that's effectively just because you're maybe you're breaking these stable bonds and you're making unstable bonds which then react with each other and you wind up with all sorts of other processes happening um, within these polymers but it comes down to high energy light moves electrons from stable bonding orbitals into unstable orbitals so <laughs> this happens every time you bring two atoms close together Every time you bring two atoms close together, their orbitals interact with each other to make these, these linear combination orbitals. And when we're only talking about two atoms at a time, that's not that hard to wrap your head around. It's still really abstract, so don't get me wrong. Um, but you can see how, okay, it would, it would scale exponentially. 
as we start including four of our atoms at a time, we have a whole bunch more orbitals happening, a whole bunch more mixing of these different atomic orbitals to make these new hybridized orbitals. Um, and basically, and it does scale exponentially. If we, we start with a single lithium atom versus two lithium atoms, lithium will actually make a covalent bond with itself as well when you bring these together because it has a partially occupied um, 2s orbit, right? Just like hydrogen does. And so you start from a single 2s and then you wind up making a bond between the two that you bring together. Then if you bring a third one in, we actually have three different ways we can make these, these orbitals interact together. And then if you bring a fourth one, it continues to increase. We continue to get more and more different ways of combining these. So you can imagine how if we continue this on until we had a mole of lithium atoms at a time, we're going to have a mole of orbitals mixing together to make what's essentially not discrete orbitals anymore. They wind up behaving as what we call bands. If you have enough orbitals all close enough to the same energy, none of them are going to have the exact same energy, but they're going to be all so close to the same energy that they behave like it's a continuum now. This is one of the reasons why classical mechanics and quantum mechanics appear to be two different things. Seems like there's the quantum realm, and then there's there's like, oh, and then there's like regular Newtonian physics. Regular Newtonian physics comes from quantum mechanics. It's an emergent phenomenon because as you mix enough of these together, it gets to the point where you can't tell the difference from one orbital to another orbital. It's a little bit like holding a magnifying glass up to a TV screen so that you could see individual pixels. But then as you zoom out, then you all of a sudden you don't see individual picture, pixels anymore. You get just a general picture, right? And it looks like the average of all the pixels together. That's basically what happens when we look at condensed phases. And by condensed phases, I specifically mean solids and liquids. Solids and liquids behave differently than gases because there are so many atoms together that they don't behave like a real quantum material anymore. Individual molecules are still small enough, we can still see and measure individual orbitals. We can't measure individual orbitals, we have a mole of lithium atoms together. What we can see is that some there's some of the same properties though. Um, so once we get to the point where we're dealing with an entire, they call this a bulk material, um, all at once, instead of individual atoms, we don't think about it in terms of individual uh, orbitals anymore. This whole section is made up of all the bonding orbitals that have electrons in them. And so the sum of all of these occupied orbitals, we call the valence band. The valence band is just all the electrons and all the orbitals that have electrons in them together kind of smeared out to make this continuum instead of being discrete lines now. And then above that, the area that doesn't have any electrons in it is higher energy orbitals. We call the conduction band. And the conduction band and the valence band and the way they interact is what gives insulators versus conductors versus semiconductors their different properties. Right. And so that what is the difference in energy between the conduction band and the valence band is what allows us to classify things as either a conductor, semiconductor, or an insulator. A conductor has no gap in energy between the valence band and the conduction band. So it's really, you don't need to, to promote electrons from a low energy state to a high energy state. They're just they're able to sort of move up and down as needed. So, and we can kind of think of this, we kind of think of electrons as a fluid when we're dealing with these. Um, if you think about um, this being one long wire, 
If I put extra electrons in one side, I have extra electrons over here that are a little bit above the valence band in terms of energy. What happens if you have a flat surface of water and you dump in extra water to one side? It spreads out across the whole thing, right? Or what happens if you lower the energy on one side? If you have a big pan of water, a big like shaping dish full of water, and you tipped it sideways. Water all flows downhill, right? Lower in energy. Electrons behave the same way. If I dump extra electrons into one side of a conductor, they just spread out over the whole thing and they move from one side to the other side of the material. Or if I have one end of the material it's hooked up to a lower energy state than the other state, this is what we did with our voltaic cells. Our voltaic cells, we had high energy electrons at one side, low energy place for the electrons to go on the other side. And the conductor, the conductor between the two, the wire that we used with the multimeter built into it, was basically just a way for the electrons to move from one side to the other side, from a high energy state to a low energy state. And that works because there's no gap in the energy between the conduction band and the valence band. If you have a large gap in energy, adding more electrons into the valence band doesn't really work. There's really no place for them to go. If I tried to add extra electrons right here, kind of like wouldn't accept them really because there's no place to put them. It would be like, okay, let's think about my chafing dish full of water, water again. If I had a lid over the top of it, if it was filled all the way to the brim and I put a watertight lid on the top that had a little spout where I could add extra water, I tried to add extra water to a vessel that's already filled and covered across the top. Where does the water go? It can't go into that system, right? There's no room for it. And so it, all an insulator is, is a material where the conduction band and the valence band have a big gap in energy between them. You want to put an um, extra electron into a conductor, they have to be really high electrons right, really high energy electrons. And even then, they're not necessarily going to be able to flow downhill in energy to the valence band because there's no room. And so basically with enough, let me think of the best way to phrase this. There's no such thing as a true conductor or a true insulator. There's no perfect insulator that insulates current completely. Because if you get a big, it doesn't matter how big this energy gap is, you get a voltage difference that's big enough, you can force electrons into it anyway. If I force electrons here, they have to go somewhere. It just takes a lot of voltage to do it. And that's basically what lightning is. Air is a pretty good insulator, but it's not a perfect insulator because the, there's no such thing as a perfect insulator. If you apply enough voltage, if you have a big enough potential energy difference between one cloud and another cloud, it'll force electrons into the conduction band of the air. And then that moves the charge from one place to another place. If you split the difference, really the, the difference between a semiconductor and an insulator is kind of semantics. You kind of just have to pick up a random point to say, above this cutoff, it's an insulator. But technically, semiconductors and insulators behave the same way. The semiconductors, you just don't need as big a voltage difference. And so that's all a semiconductor really is, is a material that's got a gap between the conduction band and the valence band, but it's not a big gap in voltage. And that means it's easy to access using batteries or using um, are using light, and that's all an LED really is. An LED is basically using voltage from the wall to move electrons into the conduction band, and then when they fall down, that generates a photon, just like moving electrons from, from this energy state to that energy state would generate a photon. The only difference is when the condensed phase material, we're dealing with bands, not individual orbits. So you get kind of like a, a spectrum of light coming off of these materials instead of having just a single energy level. 
where you're moving from one energy level to another energy level. And so they behave a little bit differently than the gas phase halogen lamp, um, lamps that we use that we use when we did our spectro spectroscopy lab, um, and the old two halogen lights that would go into um, these. Probably these actually still might be old enough. These might be halogen bulbs. Um, but halogens, those are gases, so they don't have those conduction versus valence bands. They still have discrete energy levels. They still have orbitals that you can see and measure the difference in. Versus LEDs and semiconductors in general have like a, a continuum of possibilities where you can find electrons. You can find an electron anywhere from here to here. Remember how I said we think about the electrons as being fluids? So it's a little bit like saying how, you know, how high off of this, off of the um, bottom of the lake is a water molecule. It can be anywhere from the bottom up to the surface, right? The, there's not like there's discrete bookshelves where you could find, okay, here's the first level of water molecules, then a second level of water molecules. It's kind of an even continuum from the bottom of the lake up to the surface of the lake, right? But gases don't behave quite the same way. So gases, use, halogen lamps use the same principles, but they're not as good at having sort of a, a range of spectrum or a spectrum of light. Um, and I guess I should, it's on the page here, but this energy gap between the conduction band and the valence band is called the band gap. Easy enough, right? It's the gap between the bands. And the valence band is always where you find the electrons and the conduction band is where you can have, um, where you can put electrons, if you promote an electron. And the band gap is basically that empty space between orbitals where you can't find an electron in this energy level. You can only find them in the valence band or if you promote them into the conduction band, but this is no man's land. That's where you will never find an electron. Basically, when you if an electron falls from the conduction bands to the valence bands, it ceases to exist in the conduction band and it begins existing in the valence band. It doesn't it doesn't actually physically fall. It's not like it's really, really fast through that energy, that energy gap in the middle. It actually physically ceases to exist in one place and it starts to exist in another place simultaneously. Um, you can the best the real, like closest thing to teleportation. Exactly. That's where I was thinking. You know, the best way to and that to understand is it's like if the electron is teleporting from one place to another. It's not actually traveling through that energy gap. Is that how we've looked into teleportation? I don't know if they can scale that up. It is really something that you have to be you have to be on the um on the quantum scale for that to really happen because the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is what allows these energy gaps to happen. And so you have to be talking about particles that are small enough, they have measurable wave properties and measurable particle properties at the same time. Anything even just as big as a, as a proton is too big for that to really happen. Really only happens when you get to molecule or uh, particles the size of a single electron. I know, what are we doing, right? <laughs> All right, so semiconductors are a really, really big deal in our lives. Basically, our lives as they currently exist are possible because of semiconductors. Computers are only possible because of semiconductors. Um, and so this is probably the single most important type of uh, material science, single most important application of material science uh, in our world today is understanding how semiconductors work. Um, there's a lot of other applications as well beyond computers, but computers are so ubiquitous right now that it's, it's a really big field of study. Like only like develop certain areas 
produce semiconductors too, or is what is that? The chips or basic. So let's let's talk about that. Silicon is one of the most abundant. We talked about with silicates, right? Silicon and oxygen are the two most abundant elements on the surface of the planet in the crust of the planet. And yet semiconductors are still super, super valuable. Uh, and that's because of the process that you actually need to make these. In order for, for silicon to make a good semiconductor, it has to be pretty much perfectly crystalline. Um, and that means that you can't just take silicon oxide, silicon dioxide, um, glass or sand, and turn that into a semiconductor. You have to take the silicon, reduce it so it's in its atomic state, and then be really, really careful about how you let it crystallize. Our lab this week and next week is a crystallization lab where we're going to actually make some crystals. Um, and we'll see that there's lots of places for crystal defects to happen. And so that's why there's, they're actually, they grade different levels of silicon. There's like monocrystalline silicon is what you want to make your computer chips out of and what you want to make your solar cells out of. Then there's like semi-crystalline silicon that has a lot of defects into it. Either there's lots of uh, what they call vacancies when you're trying to make this crystal structure. If it doesn't grow perfectly, you can wind up with it having an empty spot in the middle. We've only dealt with crystal structures as though they were perfect. When we talk about face centered versus body centered, et cetera, we assumed that they all behaved perfectly. That's not how the real world works though. The faster you try to make a semiconductor, the faster you try to make a crystal period, the more defects show up. The more other stuff gets mixed in there, the more vacancies you get. Um, sometimes you get what's called a grain boundary, where you wind up with a perfectly perfect crystal that's offset from another crystal so that they have this sort of like breaking point where they're not perfectly set up next to each other. So it's really the production of the silicon semiconductors that's the tricky part. And that's why any, any possible particle mixed in can cause substitution um, defects. Um, and if, especially if it's a different size, you wind up with it throwing off all of the crystal structure around it. One atom can throw off an entire area and throw up a hundred other atoms in terms of their spacing. Um, and that, so that's why if you've seen pictures of, of semi, semiconductor production, they're always wearing um, like hazmat suits, right? But they have to be in clean rooms. Can't even allow dust in there. Because basically the way you make this is you melt, you reduce silicon, and then you melt it. So there's a liquid, and then you let it cool down really, really slowly. And you basically grab a corner of it and pull, and it starts creating this crystal where you draw it out. And the, what follows it is this like tube of perfectly crystalline silicon if you do it really perfectly, um, which is really, really hard to do. And it results in lots of like mediocre crystals as well. Mm -hmm. And so, a lot of um, a lot of like cheap solar panels or cheap um, computer chips for that matter are made of uh, silicon that's not as perfectly crystalline. And so you wind up with more flaws in, in it and means it, that when you're trying to use it to, um, to conduct operations to do math for you in a computer, you wind up with a lot of errors, a lot of dropped sums, they call it, where it doesn't carry the math through properly. Um, and the nicer computer chips you buy, the better the quality of the silicon crystals are literally um, inside them. Um, the other thing that is really interesting about this is that we can, they actually noticed when they were first starting to do this, that if you can, if you make one of these interstitial impurities, if you substitute silicon for something like aluminum, that's off by one atomic number, it's almost the same identical size, but it's missing an electron compared to the silicon. It's missing a proton, missing an electron. You can wind up with, um, you can wind up tweaking these energy levels and the band gap. So that process is called doping. Um, doped semiconductors are basically, okay, instead of having a perfect set up, perfect crystal of silicon, you substitute in something like phosphorus or boron 
into one of those same spots. Phosphorus has an extra electron. And so you get an area that has extra electrons in it, which affects those, those band gaps and your valence band versus your conduction band. If you mix in things that have too many or more electrons, you still wanna be close to the same size so that they can fit into the same space, the same lattice structure without throwing off. We wanna avoid things like this, if you put in an atom that's too big and it jumbles everything up around it. But if we do this, we can still get a perfect crystalline structure, but with different electronic properties. The electron energy levels and the number of electrons you have can be a little bit different, even though the grid still looks the same, the lattice still looks the same. Um, and if we did something like uh, put a boron and said boron's missing electrons compared to silicon. And so this one, if it's if you mix it in so that there's um, fewer electrons, if you mix in something that is deficient in electrons compared to silicon, they call that a p-type semiconductor, p for positive. It's got fewer electrons than it normally would. Versus if you mix in something that has extra electrons, you get an n-type semi so n for negative. You've got extra electrons in it. And what that really does is it basically shifts these energy levels up or down relative to the number of electrons you have. So this is a, uh, another way of looking at the, those band gaps. Um, if you have a metal, if you have a conductor, then there's not really a distinction between your valence band and your conduction band. They're really just continuous. Semi-metals have an a area where there's fewer energy levels um, in between, but they're still kind of connected like that. Semiconductors have a, a full gap between conduction band and valence band. And these P-type versus N-type basically shift these energy levels up or down relative to the energy of the electrons inside them. Um, and what that does is that allows us to do things like put two, if you put an N type up against a P type, that's actually going to cause a shift in those energy levels that will cause those electrons to flow downhill in energy. Um, this dotted lines E sub F is called the Fermi level after Enrico Fermi, um, who worked on the Manhattan Project really really important in early quantum mechanics. Um, also, the guy who came up with the Fermi paradox, for those of you um, who are into um, science fiction, if you've heard of the science, the Fermi paradox is the, uh, it's the same, same guy, same Italian guy who basically, while he was working on the Manhattan Project, um, he was sitting alone by himself while people were having a conversation around him. And he was thinking about, he was running numbers in his head. Okay, if there are this many suns in our galaxy, and there are this many galaxies in the universe, and there are this many planets around each sun, how how come we've never observed life on another planet? Um, and so the Fermi paradox is really there's this many planets, how come we don't see life? And the, the story is that he's in the middle of surrounded by people having this other conversation at lunch during the on the Manhattan Project. So other Nobel Prize winners, and he just looks at everybody as where are they all? And nobody had any idea what he was talking about. So he had to go through his map and explain what he was talking about. Oh, the aliens, where are they? There shouldn't be some aliens based on how many planets and how many suns and how many galaxies. Um, that's called the Fermi Paradox. It's a really interesting read if you're interested in, in things like that. What's that? I feel like if you saw a floating alien and then like <laughs> a telescope and see dinosaurs. We are, that, right? that would be cool. We are potential aliens. Well, we are to other people. To other. And now we're getting into the discussion of it, about the, the word human yeah. versus, versus uh, animal. Um, the second Avengers <laughs> game book did a good express, or, uh, discussion about that, the difference between intelligent life and consciousness. Um, again, if you're into that sort of thing, it's a pretty easy read. What is it called? Speaker for the Dead, I think. 
Right? And it's the second book by the same author. The author has got some questionable ideas as well, but that happens odd how that happens so much with sci-fi authors. Um is yeah, don't don't ruin. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, don't read too much into Orson Scott Hart's personal beliefs. But he wrote some really good books early on. Just pretend he only wrote two. Um, all right. So what is, how am I going to test you on any of this? We're not going to do anything. The only class I ever took where we actually did things that were calculated for me, energy levels, and we we actually ran simulations on um, different types of semiconductors and doping versus non-doping and what the different dopants would do. That was a grad level electrical engineering class. Um, so that's not something we're gonna do in this class. I mainly want you to be aware of these concepts. The idea of what's the difference between a metal versus a semiconductor versus an insulator um, and what doping is. On a, just at a conceptual level, like something like at this level. It's the reason I picked this figure. We're not getting more in depth than just looking at it like this. E type means you have you're missing electrons, and type means you don't fit so that you have extra electrons. So let's talk about little bit about nanotechnology and how carbon, carbon also is a semiconductor. Silicon is a really useful semiconductor, mainly because one, it's really, really abundant on earth. It's really, really valuable in terms of photovoltaics because the natural band gap in silicon is about 1.1 volts, which actually corresponds really nicely to the peak of the um, solar spectrum. The solar spectrum, the sun produces light in somewhat of a bell curve shape. And if you look at, um, so where the height is the number of photons per second, and the X is, is the frequency, the frequent, the energy that corresponds with the peak here is yellow light. Our eyes, yellow is the center of our, of the visible spectrum because our eyes evolved um, in the presence of our sun. Our sun's solar spectrum dictates the visible spectrum to everything that developed in, this, in the presence of the sun, right? Why would humans ever develop eyes that could see photons the sun doesn't put out? There's no reason for evolution to do that, right? Um, so the, the peak of the solar spectrum is, is yellow light. This is where you see the most photons are yellow that come from the sun per second. And that energy corresponds to about 1.1 volts. So basically silicon is really valuable in terms of photovoltaics because it's a natural semi, it's a semiconductor that already has that band gap such that it can absorb light from our sun really, really well. If we were trying to design solar cells to work on a different around the solar system that had a different solar spectrum. If the solar spectrum looked, or even the same one, if it, um, as the sun ages, the solar spectrum is gonna shift more towards the red. So it might look something more like this in, you know, 2 billion years. In which case, if that's 0 0.7 volts, say, we'd wanna be using semiconductors that had a band gap of 0 0.7 volts for all of our solar cells. Right, so silicon is really, really valuable for a few reasons. Crystalline silicon is really convenient. If we're going to have to make perfect crystalline materials to make computer chips out of, we might as well pick a semiconductor that's really, really prevalent on Earth. Why bother picking a semiconductor that's really hard to find? It's already hard enough to make it pure, right? Um, and then also it just coincidentally happens to have the same band gap that matches the solar spectrum. So in theory, we could use, we can use any semiconductor to make solar cells, but just like our eyes evolved to be with the visible spectrum to be centered around yellow light, 
why would we pick a semiconductor that's not that doesn't have a band gap that matches most of the photons coming from the sun? Is it is it as difficult to create like perfect crystalline structures with other materials? Do you know? It depends on the material. Yeah. But yeah, if you're if you're trying to minimize those defects, everything is going to be hard. Silicon is particularly hard because it has to happen at a really high temperature. The melting point of silicon is well above the melting point yeah. of iron and things like that. Yeah. Um, so if you know, if we're just trying to make it, um, a perfect crystal, we could use something with a lower melting point, and then that should make it easier to make it crystallize out perfectly. But if we want it to be a perfect crystal and to be a semiconductor, silicon is the best choice of what we have so far um, of the materials we've found. Is that would also make it like harder on on the on the outside, you know, like. Uh... That's true. You would probably, yeah. That the, one of the nice things about silicon having such a high melting point is once you've made it into a perfect crystal structure, it'll tend to stay in that perfect crystal structure because you know computer chips operate at really high temperatures, a couple hundred Celsius. If you had something with a melting point was six hundred Celsius and it's operating at two hundred Celsius, um, then you start running the risk of that crystal structure deforming just due to the heat of use. Is there any correlation between the, the bonding orbitals and the lower energy orbitals being also closer to the nuclei that are involved? That's usually the case, right? Absolutely, because lower energy orbitals tend to be closer to the nuclei because there's a positive attractive force between the positive charge of the nucleus and the negative charge of the electron. They're just being pulled towards the bottom. They can't fall all the way to the nucleus because of the Heisenberg conservative principle. Um, and so that's that's what creates these energy levels and these sort of um, and these probability functions that we call orbitals is based on that uncertainty principle. But yeah, they tend to all the lowest energy orbitals are always closest to the nucleus. Um, and in fact, If this right here has the conduction band and the valence band here, notice it has other orbitals down there too. They're even lower in energy. Those are our core orbitals. So if the valence band is a mixture of all the different two p electrons or three p electrons, all of the one s and the two s are going to be down way down here in energy, and they're all half full. So they're basically not useful because nothing ever changes. They're so low in energy that you can't access them. And obviously the, the issue too is the way these raw P orbitals is so basic where it looks as though it was crossing through the very center of a nucleus, but really that's not actually the case, right? That the S are there, S orbitals? The S orbitals are there. And, and even you know, for convenience sake, we draw them like this a lot. And a lot of times we'll have them drawn like this. So that you have, you see the phase of the orbitals, um, but really more accurately, we can draw them like this with this small gap in the middle where there's zero or there's a node in the middle where there's zero probability of finding an electron. And but then on top of this, if this is a 2p orbital, um, there's also a 2p orbital that is coming out of the board towards us and into the board away. And then there's one that's going straight up and straight down. There's, so those are our three different pieces of the p orbital then on top of that if this is a 2p there's also the 2s that kind of exists on top of all of those and it's not like it exists just right here in the middle where that node is it actually kind of overlaps with all these but the orbitals can't truly interact with each other because their their functions are are orthogonal to each other which in linear algebra sense means it's not a lot of times in linear algebra, we use that to mean perpendicular or that they're, uh, but it's more than that. It actually does not just mean perpendicular. It means that the functions don't interact with each other well. You can add them together, but you don't really get one function interacting with another function if they're orthogonal. And that's what allows them to occupy the same space physically, is that the functions are still orthogonal to each other. 
Um, so four rules are weird. It's a bullet point here. Um, linear algebra helps us, but it's also true. Linear that orbitals are one of the coolest things because they they kind of take all the weirdest parts of math and mix them all together. Yeah, these functions are orthogonal to each other, and we can make a linear combination to them, but they're not linear functions. They're actually periodic functions in spherical coordinates um, that also involve imaginary numbers. So you take all of those ideas together. And you get an idea of what happens when you hybridize these orbitals. You start with these weird, funky, spherical coordinate periodic functions, and then you mix them together in linear combinations, and you get something that looks like a combination of both of them, but doesn't really behave like either of them. It has a certain energy associated as well. If I have one or less, one or even less. Uh, electrons, whether plus one or minus one, it really changed so much. It I mean, definitely can, right? And changing just not having electrons in one part of the p orbital changes how those electrons, those orbitals mix together. Because if this front and back orbital just doesn't have electrons in it, it's empty space. It's a function that still exists, but it's a function that exists without an electron occupying it. And it interacts with the other ones that have electrons in them, but can't doesn't get mixed together with them to make these hybridized orbitals the same way. Um, obviously, this is orbitals are something I could talk about for a long time um, because I, if you're and if you're interested in that and how we can computationally look at these things, ask me about it another time um, because that was my grad school research was actually coming up with numbers and weights for these different LCAL approaches and then working backwards from that to get energies out of that. So we could compare energy of this state to the energy of that state. Um, and you can't do it by hand. Turns out you can't solve the, for the energy of an electron um, unless if there's a, unless it's a system that only has one nucleus and one electron. As soon as you involve two electrons, you can't solve it by hand. You can't get an analytical answer to it because it's a three-body problem, um, which has its own set of math associated with it. You basically can't solve that with the math that humans know right now. So anyway, let's take a break. Let's come back at five after, and we'll talk more about carbon and nanotechnology. Let's make diamonds. Let's make diamonds. Uh, diamonds are boring. We'll make, we'll make nano dots. Dragon toothpaste or dragon toothpaste? No. Jesus, yeah, I'm going outside. I feel like I'm playing. It's like 20 minutes of daylight in between rain. Good <laughs> event. Um, yeah, I bust out of here for a bit. Good event. Yeah, yeah, I gotta get some other stuff. Yeah, but um, I would say there are two years in the state of the one that on wheat potato, and that's just the uh, what we were using just the liquid with the enzymes in there, or we actually using the blended um, pieces, and whether we're gonna, if it's a liquid, how much we're gonna use, like milliliter wise, or if it's the actual blended potato. You do the same. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's the only thing that I have to question. Everything else, let me know what you think about it. I don't follow what you did today. But that was Yeah. Well, you know, we're using the liquid as well. Yeah, it's not going to be too much. But I'm going to say that's the only missing spot right there. You see that? It's certainly a Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Is it just you guys in your project together? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, we've been pretty good so far, yeah. Nice. Yeah. And at some point, everyone's presenting on that. Mm -hmm.
And then the uh, two weeks from Thursday? Yeah. Two weeks, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's not like we know what So far, yeah. Yeah. I think we got a pretty good off and I think it's just a 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 good Yeah. Do you like the lab process more than lecture? Or yeah. do you like lecture more? I think that's the lab. Do you like it more? I just like being more hands on. Like a little bit. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. 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 Um, well, I've been like inside, like I had a certificate off of here in my head. Yeah. And then, uh, you elaborate the more than seven weeks? Nine, 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 nine to like 12 almost. I don't think it's like we've been working on a project, so one yeah. of those two things we, uh, like this is kind of the first Tuesday. Well, we've been doing a little bit in the lab for our project. Everybody else kind of researching, making a plan, figuring out what they're going to do and how to do it. You kind of feel like you guys take a year's out while. Um, no. We, we kind of have like an idea and like, yeah, we talked to Sean one day and I feel, I feel like we kind of solidified what we're going to do, but then we still have to figure out exactly how to do it. Yeah. Like the steps that we're gonna take with everything. We're gonna make up like a procedure, like a lab report and everything. Yeah. What's up, baby? What's going on? How's your uh, project going saying? Oh uh, freaking out. Right? <laughs> I mean it's going. Uh, we noticed that there's some plants growing. Oh I know. Yeah, it's pretty fun. It uh definitely I took a break to study for physics and that's to you know uh I had to like remember that strap and snap that yeah I was looking at it today I saw I saw that you they were doing it I think they uh they're definitely working a lot better and I also think but <laughs> and now 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 like I have to sort of go back through. And uh, decomposing in water, um, and I mean, we have to, yeah, physics from the presentation decomposing is right, right. Uh, yeah, with like the not calculus, calculus. And the calculus and uh, the Jackson, I mean, that's the same thing. Jackson was to do um, the same thing, he's like, they don't know, they don't know, so that's good. So we might have to, you guys do your own thing. No, I think we just uh, um. Uh, he miscommunicated with the actual me and Alice. Um, yeah. So that ultimately that was Stephen's working for this guy. Yeah, I actually think I'm going to go to the moments and get back to work. I think it's very yeah. yeah, Jerry and I did our cognitive project yesterday. Yeah. Project. Like, it's not. Yeah. What you do? Uh, we're doing uh, well, I'm the <laughs> no, yeah. okay. uh, like applications for like, so, like, like the 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 system 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 system. like math level okay. uh, so, we're talking, trying to talk to Wynn about it, like, she just didn't want to know she wanted. Uh, yeah, she was just like, I just want a project. Yeah, okay. Well, basically, I don't think I don't like. I don't think she's gonna yeah. very, very well. I don't think so either. I think it's gonna be like a kind of yeah. Yeah. Is it in the white page or in like the nice page? Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna dip. Yeah. Gonna go. Blue yeah. shift yeah. to a post and white. <laughs> yeah. Presentations by Brian? Yeah. 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 And we'll see. Unbelievable. See, uh, Get a, get a cattle prod for Jackson. Yeah, I think that. I have a bag. Talk to Kathy about it. 
Yeah, yeah. projects yeah. are extremely valuable and extremely frustrating for the same reason. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Um, actually yeah. Right. But, yeah. Yeah, I thought it's like a.
an AA in STEM doesn't really mean anything, right? Nobody's finishing with an AA degree if you're taking this class. Um, you're all transferring to other programs where you're going to get your bachelor's, your master's, or so on. Um, that doesn't mean that the AA is worthless to LTCC. Even if you're going to continue on somewhere else and you continue getting school, then you don't really care about your AA diploma. Um, it actually is really helpful for LTCC's numbers and funding um, that we get as many AAs issued as possible. So if you're going to be here and filling our transfer requirements for other programs, um, you're probably also going to qualify to graduate. Whether or not you care about that piece of paper that says you have an AA, it's helpful for us um, if you still file a register, even if you don't walk, just filing to, and getting that diploma is really helpful to LTCC. Um, it's a little bit extra paperwork on your end, but it makes a big difference to our numbers. We're such a small school that a couple extra graduates a year um, actually makes a difference in our funding. Um, and we still get funding for you if you transfer without getting the AA. We get more funding if you get the degree as you transfer. So as you're going through that process, I would highly, if it's just a couple, um, couple extra clicks, a little bit of extra um, paperwork to fill out, I would highly encourage you to do that um, to help out LTCC in general, help out the people coming after you that still get better funding. People. So you're telling me I should have yeah. stopped with just my AA? Are you planning on? No. Okay, <laughs> I didn't think so. I didn't think I was going on a limb by saying that. Um, there are some there are some science degrees where you can you can get a job with an AA and you don't have to go beyond that, but almost always you're going to get better higher paying jobs with the batch. I think forestry is the one that comes to mind. You can get a job with a forestry AA. Sorry, not even a bachelor is gonna get you good money. <laughs> um, but environmental science, you can still do a lot of the same work as forestry and study a lot of the same stuff, but you get to be in the managerial positions rather than the um, the being the gopher that actually has to go out you can still you can still do that be the one who goes out in the forests and runs crews and stuff like that, um, but you'll be better paid if you have the bachelor's um, in in those areas. With that said, I don't think forestry actually requires Chem one hundred three. I think forestry well, does. It does. If you're transferring to certain schools, there you go. So, but might as well get that AA while you're at it because even if it just sits on a shelf, I don't have to my diplomas up anywhere. I don't care about piece of paper, but it's still nice to be able to put on your resume and it helps the school. So highly recommend graduation. On the other hand, that's a, that's a year to year thing, depending on the weather. It's going to be really hot. I mean, I don't, I didn't walk for my master's. I didn't, I didn't even get to plan on getting my piece of paper for my master's. It just like, actually caught up with me through the mail forwarding. Um, I just left the folder because I was done the folder and took my, just put master's on my, um, anyway, uh, so I'm going to have a question. Sorry. Yeah. Did you have any other job for certification after getting your master's? So I was in a PhD program, and so I, it took four years for me to finish my master's because I wasn't planning on getting a master's. It's actually kind of similar. Like, well, I'm not going to, why would I file for my master's? I'm getting my PhD. And if you have a PhD, the master's is implied. Just like if you have a bachelor's, the AA is implied. Um, and then, so I actually had to file for my master's program or my master's degree as I was in the process of leaving my, my dissertation group, um, which created a whole separate issue of politics. And I had to do it in the right order or my, my advisor was the type of guy that would have blocked me getting my master's to keep me on the hook for my PhD. Um, so I, but that was a highly toxic environment, obviously. Um, so I did not, I worked as researcher after I was done with my coursework for about three years. I finished my coursework in a year and a half and then spent the, another two and a half years just doing research, but I was still, I was still a grad student technically. And I just wasn't, Grad student is a weird category because you're not actually a, a student in the sense you're taking classes for most of it. If you're in a PhD program, most of it is doing research, um, but they still call it a student. Um, but no, after that, then I started teaching pretty right, pretty quickly. Um, I applied for a few jobs, but then realized that I would not want to work for Chevron. 
And that's where I had my, my in. Um, and decided I was going to not work for big oil. Um, and then I had more fun talking about science than actually doing science. So, <laughs> to, all right, let's talk about graphite and diamonds. So carbon is one up from silicon. Silicon is a pretty good natural semiconductor band gap of 1.17 volts. Um, germanium is a decent semiconductor as well with a smaller band gap. Basically, as you go down in the periodic table, you go from non-metal, metalloid to metals. Um, and part of that is the, the band gap changes. Silicon to germanium, you go from 1.17 volts to about 0.7 volts. And then you go one step further in your tin, which is a conductor. So a zero band gap at that point. Carbon is an interesting case because it actually has two stable structures um, when it's in its elemental state. Graphite actually is a conductor. It has a band gap of zero. But diamond has the same lattice structure as crystalline silicon um, and has a band gap that's technically a semiconductor, although it's really on the edge of being an insulator. Um, diamond has a band gap of about 5.7 volts. Um, so we're, we're like pretty high energy in order to get electrons move into that conduction band. So diamond doesn't get used as a semiconductor in traditional semiconductor applications, but graphite has, is, is a full-on conductor. Um, there is a very, very, technically it's a very small band gap semiconductor. There is a difference. Um, between the conduction band, the gap between the conduction band and the valence band in graphite, but it's so small that we can effectively just call it a conductor, um, which actually leads to really interesting things. You could actually take a pencil and draw a circuit on a piece of paper, use the pencil let the graphite as the wire between the different components, um, which is a pretty cool project. You can do that with middle schoolers. Um, where you and you literally like just like put a piece of tape on the end of a resistor on both ends and connect it and then draw lines to the next the next thing, um, which is kind of fun. And then you just use the nine volt battery to power it. Um, which anyway, um, those interesting properties, graphite being is a conductor, the diamond is a semiconductor. It really opened the doors to the way that we're thinking about how these materials work. And so diamond and graphite specifically um, are one of the things that led to a lot of nanotechnology. Um, basically by taking conductors and turning them into small distinct particles, instead of just being one bulk molecule, one bulk material, we could change the electronic properties. We can turn a conductor into a semiconductor by making it, instead of being one sheet of metal into tiny little particles of metal. That's all nanotechnology really is, is actually taking these, these macroscopic materials and manipulating them into really, really tiny structures at the molecular level. And that changes their, their electronic properties. Um, so these glowing tubes, they're all fluorescing under UV. They're actually all made from the same material. These are all gold nanoparticles. Gold's a really good conductor, but if you make it into small enough pieces, it acts like a semiconductor. It turns out the size of those pieces dictates the wavelength of light and the band gap of the material. So by literally just taking a, a big piece of gold and making it into smaller pieces of gold, you can control that. Um, because in one of the ways you can understand that is if you think of, of these orbitals as being, being waves, so if you have a really big material, then you have, you basically have this entire area where you can put, um, you can put the electrons and the whole thing behaves like it's one big standing wave. But if you take that and you split it in half, now the wavelength that you can fit into that space is cut in half, right? If you cut it in half again, 
and the wavelength of that standing wave gets even smaller. So we can actually influence the energy levels by looking at the size of the box that we're keeping the electron in. We think about material as being a box that's containing the electron. It, it, in physics, they call it the particle in the box. Um, and when you take modern physics, you'll actually have to calculate these energies at the different wavelengths um, or for the different frequencies. Um, but basically, by making this exceptionally small, you wind up with a case where you can control what that energy level is, and it's no longer a conductor once you get to a small enough size. And so the largest, the largest wavelength that we see here is going to be the largest particles. The lowest energy light is in the largest particles because we're confining it least. And then the smallest, uh, the highest frequency, so smallest wavelength means the smallest particles. You know, all literally all we're doing is just all nanotechnology started with is well, if we if we grow these particles as crystals and then stop that crystal growth right away, whereas after a certain amount of time, then the average particle size stops growing at that point. And so basically a lot of nanotechnology is just being able to stop crystals growing at the right point. Um, and if you, this is also the same general principle that allows us to make LED TVs. LED TVs, the pixels of the different um, LEDs in an LED TV are all different nanoparticles of different sizes. And all you have to do is hit them with the electron um, with, at the right voltage, and you get it to glow whatever the, based on what the size of that particle is. You mix all those different colors together, and you get a TV where you can control these that doesn't involve throwing electrons I said throwing electrons at it earlier, but we were physically throwing that, which is made hooked up in a circuit. Remember like the old, old big screen TVs when they first came out? Why were those screens so terrible? Like they like wore, they got worn out so fast and like cloudy and like. So instead of being a diode, they were kind of like a diode, but they were actually based more on fluorescence. And you basically, I guess this is still fluorescence, but they were based on fluorescence like you literally you literally threw electrons at them and a high energy electron would hit them and then fall down on an energy level and give off light. Um, but they actually did it by physically sending electrons through space and manipulating where those electrons went with magnetic fields inside the TV. That's very complicated. It was very complicated. Um, but the earliest, they called them the phosphors, were the little dots that would glow when they got hit. The earliest phosphors very quickly would become oxidized. Um, and so that's why they used, and electrons in general um, couldn't be controlled with a great degree of accuracy, um, especially if there was other air molecules in the way. The electrons would hit other air molecules and get diverted and might have gone wrong spot. And so that's, they tried to create these, they called them vacuum tubes. They tried to make it so that there were no gas molecules in the way, but you can't make a true vacuum either. And so as they got older, um, as there were more air leaks into the vacuum screen, into the vacuum tube part of it, as the phosphor started breaking down, they got fuzzier and fuzzier the older they would get. Um, and actually, if you, if you ever saw one of those things break, they actually implode. We had a really, really old one from the seventies when I was in um, when I was in high school. We found it on the side of the road. I said, "We, not my family, me and my high school friends." We're like, "Well, this is a garbage black and white TV, but we're having a bonfire. Let's just throw the TV in the bonfire um, because we were high schoolers, um, and that's what you did." And we did that and just sat there and it kind of burned for a little bit, and then it imploded um, when it when the vacuum tube finally broke it actually compromised the integrity of the whole thing and the screen like imploded inward, which was not what we were expecting. That um, sounds like the way, like like the bending the electrons to where you want them to go mm -hmm. to get the, to give off light. Like that seems like more complicated than like what we're talking about with the other TVs. 
but they, they didn't know how the semiconductors worked when they first developed these earliest televisions. That's why they didn't do that. Right. And so they were very, very clever mechanically. And they very, very hard to, um, to work mathematically because they basically had to do a Fourier transform on an electrical signal that would tell it to set to give it these x y coordinates, which then influenced the magnetic um, the magnets. I don't think they physically moved, but was a bunch of electromagnets magnets in the um, frame basically to create this whole process. It was very very clever. Um, but now that we know how semiconductors work, this is way better. It's why nobody's, it's not like we can take that old technology and improve it to make it comparable to this. It literally, we, we engineered it to its limit by the 90s. Um, that's why TVs basically stopped getting better from about the 80s and 90s and early 2000s until you got flat screen TVs, which was a totally new technology based on the semiconductors instead of the old cathode ray tubes. Um, if you ever see one of those, two, the um, we always used to play around with them. They had um, the computer labs would had the monitors had these buttons called a DDoS button. It would basically be like, oh, there's a magnet that's influencing here. You hit this button, it basically would reset everything, and it looked really funny. It made this little wavy lines. All the colors got really funky for a second, and then it would like settle out. Um, but if you just took a magnet and you set it on top of your CRT, um, it would totally screw with the system. And basically, you would like pull the picture up to one little corner of the uh, of the screen because you were just you were screwing with the magnets that were trying to do this really complex Fourier transform. Um, it's because they're awful. I know, but it's just like they know it's just like it seems to exist. Um, yeah, I grew up watching watching sports on one of those, and you really couldn't see a thing on the watching colors sports. Are so, like, the colors were bad, and it was so the standard definition is so bad. Um, anyway, no, it's okay. That's that's worth discussing. Kids these days have it so easy. Um, so this is just the uh, the difference. Colors the different uh, absorption <laughs> emission spectra of these different nano dots. They call these nano dots. These tiny little crystals that have they're basically we treat them like they're a sphere, um, and then the radius of the sphere is going to dictate what color they give off when you excite them with either with UV or with um, electric current. So that's what's called a nano dot. A nano dot is literally just a sphere, but that's combining the electron actually in all three dimensions. If you make a sphere out of it, right? Because it's not just like it's, a, it's not a two-dimensional object; it's a three-dimensional object. And you restrict it in all three dimensions, then you wind up with the nano dot. But you can also make what's called a nano rod or a nano tube where basically you restrict the electron's movement in two dimensions, but you allow it to move freely in third dimension and make this kind of tubular structure um, where the electron is allowed to move up and down, but not left and right very far and not in and out very far. Um, and so all that really comes from is, is we start from graphene which is a single sheet of graphite. Graphite is this, um, is these stacks of sheets on top of each other. One of the reasons it's easy to write with graphite, but it's useful in terms of um, using in a pencil, is because literally when you rub it on a piece of paper, you're rubbing off layers of the graphite on and transferring them to the paper. If you take a single layer of graphite, just one of those, you, just the top blue one or just the orange one, we, it has slightly different properties. And so we call it graphene instead of graphite. Graphite is the entire bulk material. Graphene is one layer of it. So it basically just repeats pretty much infinitely in two dimensions, but not in the third dimension. And so that's like a two-dimensional nano nanotechnology. You're restricting the motion of the electron vertically, but it can move front and back and left and right as far as it wants, anywhere along the surface. 
you take that and you wrap it, you take one sheet of this and you wrap it, it's like taking a piece of paper and turning it into a tube, right? That's what a carbon nanotube is, is one sheet of graphite, one sheet of graphene folded around to make a tube and connected at the ends. Which had these two have very different properties than each other. Carbon nanotubes you can actually use as wires in these tiny, tiny molecular machine, molecular circuits. Um, this is where the term nanotechnology really comes from. We're dealing with things, we're trying to make analogs of macroscopic objects like circuits on the molecular level. So they would so sometimes you hear. You hear them referred to as molecular wires, and the carbon nanotubes make good molecular wires um, because they're conductive along one dimension, but not in two dimensions. Uh, and then if you take that and you extend it further, you can make a one dimensional, or I, I call this a zero dimensional um, confinement, where basically you just get a dot, a single point. Um, where the electrons can exist, and that's like those nano dots from the um, from the previous slide. Um, and these are named after they call these bucky balls. Um, they're named after the arch architect, engineer Buckminster Fuller, um, was the guy who first invented the geodesic dome as an ar architectural piece, like you see for the greenhouses at the at Sierra House Elementary. Um, those that type of greenhouse is where you just have a whole bunch of hexagons or a whole bunch of triangles that you make a dome with. Those were de designed by an architect named Buckminster Fuller, was his full name. Um, and so if you do that at a molecular level, you make what's called a buckyball, or the more proper name is a fullerene. Um, But basically, we're building similar dome structures, but out of individual carbon atoms. The point where all of these come together, there's a carbon atom there and a carbon atom there. And so what you would see is like the window pane is the space between the carbon atoms. And these have their own, their own physical properties. And so nanotechnology was, it was kind of a huge buzzword 10 years ago. Um, 20 years ago to 10 years ago was really, really big um, because there's like it was like this whole new field. We finally got these tools where we could take this graphite and turn it into carbon nanotubes. Carbon nanotubes are really, really strong. So they actually were looking at applications where they could use them to do things like um, build new, you know, new um, structural cables for bridges. Carbon fiber. Carbon fiber is is a was one of the early forms of this. Okay. Um, depending on the types of carbon fiber, it might have characteristics of a few of these different ones together. But in theory, carbon fiber was basically trying to make fibers you could then weave with or sew with out of things like this. But they don't never had much um, results with that. Carbon fiber, for the most part, eventually just turned into graphite. Graphite is carbon fiber in most applications. It's just treated in a way that gives it a different texture and slightly different properties. <laughs> My cortex is, yeah. Um, uh, there's uh, some other versions, um, not other versions, but other ways you can take graph graphene and turn it into various properties. Um, you can make carbon nanotubes that have um, multiple layers, so they call that multi-wall carbon nanotube. Um, you can also make what's just called a graphene nano ribbon, which is just graphene, which is a single sheet, except that it's, it's cut really, really narrow in one dimension. And it behaves slightly differently than this, electronically. Um, there's also a lot of other interesting ideas that mechanically using some of these. Um, like using large buckyballs to uh, contain heavy metal atoms um, as a method of drug delivery for things like chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is basically exposing a tumor to a poison to try and kill all the cells that are tumorous, that are cancerous. Um, but it's really bad. It really has all these negative side effects because you're literally poisoning your body. You're trying to keep it contained to the tumor 
but it never actually works that way. So, but buckyballs actually have a lot of possible applications in terms of drug delivery because you could, if you could keep the toxic molecules contained until the buckyball gets to the right part of the body where the tumor is, and then release it, you should be able to limit side effects. So there's a lot of sort of engineering and medicine applications for these this nanotechnology as well. A lot of it will never pan out. A lot of it is, you know, seemed promising, um, or it was a promising idea that they were able never able to make it work out, which is part of the reason why nanotechnology is not as big a buzzword now as it used to be, because we've moved on to other things. The things we were able to make work easily with nanotechnology, we did, and now they're just commonplace, like LEDs. Um, and the things that are really, really hard to do with nanotechnology, they're still working on or never panned out. And now there's other ways to get funding by using other buzzwords like you know, AI, things like that. Um, so it's it's something kind of goes comes and goes in waves. Um, for a while, for probably about a decade, nanotechnology was like the best way to get funding as a scientist or as an engineer to be like. Throw the word nanotechnology into your grant application, and you have a better shot of it getting funded. Um, but it is actually a real thing. Um, and it did wind up having some really, really good effects. Um, here's one of the, this is one of the original applications for these carbon nanotubes. Um, was It was thought that if you looked at just the carbon nanotubes, which are, they're growing vertically on the surface. You see this section here, they're kind of basically starting at the surface and growing upward. And they can only, only really get them to grow about 100 microns long, if that, 10 microns long. Um, but if you take them and you use a magnet or a really, really fine pair of tweezers, basically, and spin it, you can, they actually kind of stuck together. You can kind of make this like molecular yarn. Out of out of carbon nanotubes, um, and at really really small distances, it had really really promising properties in terms of uh, tensile strength. It was actually stronger than you know, if you've ever heard like oh spider silk is really really strong for a great strength to weight ratio. Carbon nanotubes are even better. The problem with both of them is that you can't scale it up to something that you could build at the human scale. So they have really, really strong fibers. And so it was thought like, okay, well, if we could get this to extend a mile long, we could actually do something like build a space elevator with it. It has enough tensile strength to weight ratio. Problem is we can never develop a process that allowed it to have that really high tensile strength over than more than, I think like a centimeter was the longest I think I've ever seen. So if you're using it to build something that's only a centimeter, it's really useful. There's just not that many applications for that. Um, it also got used a lot, carbon nanotubes got used a lot in uh, circuits and transistors where you could basically make really, really tiny transistors out of carbon nanotubes and really a lot cheaper than using um, crystalline silicon because it was cheaper to make carbon nanotubes than it was to make crystalline silicon. Problem is it was also didn't have very good crystalline structure. And so it had lots of defects built into it. So it was a lot harder to actually program with it. Uh, but in theory, you can make a, not in theory, people did make computer chips made out of carbon nanotubes instead of using, um, instead of using crystalline silicon. Um, but they never performed at a high enough level where they could compete with crystalline silicon. High end crystalline silicon is still way better than carbon nanotubes, even though you can make a computer with carbon nanotubes, it just wasn't as good of a computer. Carbides, on the other hand, carbides are actually super useful. And this is another case where understanding the crystalline structure and then manipulating it at the atomic level wound up producing really interesting materials. Um, if you put carbon as the negative ion in an ionic compound, then you get carbide. Carbide, I just mean something with a negative charge, right? So carbon with a negative charge is a carbide. 
The thing is, is it doesn't make a true ionic compound with these metal ions because it's more electronegative than the metal, but it's not as electronegative as something like chloride or oxygen. Um, so what you get when you get a covalent carbide is you get really, really, really strong materials. Um, they're, they're, and in some cases as strong as diamond. Um, and they have very specific applications like silicon carbide is an industrial abrasive. It's really good. It's really, really hard. And so you can use it to sand things down really well to, to etch things. Um, and you can do things like, like make small particles of it and mix it with water and then use the water high pressure no, uh, nozzle to blast, to like etch and sketch and uh, draw things into granite, other really hard materials. Um, use it as a way to get uh, where you can use basically not a laser cutting, but you can do a computer control um, router basically, where instead of using a piece of metal spinning, you're using this silicon carbide particles suspended in water and using that to cut things. Um, but what the place that you see carbides used all the time in, um, in home improvement stores is metallic carbides. You have a metal, the right metals actually have big enough empty spaces in between their atoms. When they're in their crystalline state, they have this empty space between the atoms that you can actually take a carbide and, and embed it into that lattice structure. So if you ever heard of tungsten carbide on uh, drill bits or saw blades, um, that's basically a way of hardening the metal so that it keeps an edge longer. Um, so that those, those drill bits and those saw blades will last longer that way. Um, I actually had a, in grad school at one of my professors um, invented that process or scaled it up. So the point uh, when he was, he was working for Dow or DuPont and they, then they leased it out to DeWall um, and they and wound up making billions and billions of dollars with it. It's still the industry standard way of making hardened with metal is to turn it into a carbide. Um, he always used that as an example of why he left industry because his, so when you work um, as an engineer or a scientist for a big company like that, it, it's part of your contract that any ideas you have while you're working for them belong to them. They technically have to compensate you for that, but that's your salary. And then you have, you're responsible for transferring a patent to them for the price of $1. So he actually had a framed $1 bill, which is the $1 he got, got for inventing the carbide hardening process that he kept framed as a reminder of why he left industry. Um, to go make his own startups instead. Um, but he never, I, I, he had some successful companies after that, but nothing like that. That's like the, his claim to fame was definitely, a, well, I did this, but I was working for somebody else and therefore it's not mine anymore. Um, so all of the, all the different aspects of uh, engineering and inventing things that you don't think about necessarily once um, you live in that area. What's that? So they, if you do that, and you will be sued into oblivion, if not Boeing. Um, that's a verb now, right? Um, no, they take they take their profits and their intellectual property very, very seriously. Like you're not allowed to leave with a thumb drive. Um, when you when you work for these companies, like everything goes through metal detectors and X-ray machines every time you come and leave. Um, and if you ever tried to leave and then patent something, um, you're not going to win that fight because they pay for better lawyers um, and they have the resources to throw in it. Mm -hmm. All right, where are we going with this? Oh, metallurgy. Okay. Um, so we've talked about transition metals. We used that term before. I know we're almost out of time here. Um, this is kind of a quick, quick topic. Um, this is interesting also from a historical aspect, but from a science and engineering history point of view, transition metals and metals in general, really, really important. You can classify like ages of human history based on what metal was most prevalent at the time, right? which is how you get the Iron Age versus the Bronze Age versus the Copper Age versus the Stone Age. 
Um, and most of the metals that we see in ores, especially, are transition metals. And transition metals are sort of are defined as having partially filled the orbitals. Um, is one definition for them. One definition for them is anything, anything to the left of the stair step line until you get to columns one and two. Um, sometimes it'll be just the D block is defined as being transition metal. Sometimes it's specifically column three through 11 are the transition metals. Um, but those properties wind up having some really interesting properties, um, one of which is that you can have more than one possible charge um, on a lot of these. And they also tend to be more stable as ions than as metals. Um, and we know these charges and we know a little bit about doing electron configurations. It's not too hard to understand um, why certain, uh, certain ions are favored. So for instance, if we looked at iron, iron is number 26 right here. What is the electron configuration of iron going to look like? Mm -hmm. You can start from R1. We started with that shorthand. Yeah. Then it'd be iron, as in its metal state, would then be 4s2, 3d6. Can we make, if we take away three electrons, can we make a stable electron configuration that way? Not perfectly stable, but we could, if we got rid of those, if we get rid of one electron, then we actually get a halfway fill the orbital. And orbitals actually, orbitals are most stable when they're either empty or full, but they've got this like kind of stable state. That corresponds with being exactly halfway filled. If we look at that 3D orbital after we've lost those electrons, but then this goes to a five, that 3D orbital winds up looking like like that, perfectly halfway filled, and all of the unpaired electrons have the same spin. When you get a bunch of electrons that are unpaired with the same spin next to each other, that creates a magnetic field that is somewhat stable. It's not as stable as all the way full or all the way empty, but that's pretty stable, just like that. And that creates magnetic properties. Um, so that's why iron ores, to, even though we usually think about metals as being magnetic, iron ores or ores, um, most of these transition metals where they have a, a uh, oxidation state where they're exactly halfway filled, their, their oxides also tend to have magnetic properties. That magnetism was first noticed historically um, from an iron ore called magnetite. It's named magnetite because it made this weird property where it attracted other metals to it. Magnetite literally is an iron oxide. Um, and because unpaired electrons with the same spin create a magnetic field. And so most of these ones that have, that have um, varying oxidation states are gonna have more than one possible state where you can make it somewhat stable by either getting rid of the 4S electrons or Losing one electron out of the D orbital will make it halfway filled, or gaining, um, in some cases, you can gain an electron to fill a D orbital up completely. Um, I'm not sure where I was going with this. This is the last thought I want to have built for right now, because I think the history of science and engineering is really fascinating. Historically, humans were only aware of four metals. Want to guess what they were? Copper, gold, tin. Copper, gold, Lead. tin was. They found it pretty early, but it was not actually uh, one of the earliest four. Bronze. Not lead. Bronze is an alloy of two of uh, um, copper and zinc. Um, copper and zinc, copper and iron. It's copper and tin. Copper and tin. Thank you. Um, 
Actually, they call them the coin metals. Copper, silver, gold. And then this is silver, actually. This is a silver nugget. But then there's one other one that showed up in its metallic state that the ancient people were also aware of. And this one's really cool, and that's iron. Um, specifically, iron that, that has been on Earth since the Earth was formed was all present as iron ore, which they didn't look like a metal, just looked like a rock. They didn't know what to do with it to make iron metal out of it. But meteoric iron is actually present on the surface of the Earth in a metallic form and has this really, really cool property um, where it has these weird hexagons. And so this is literally um, metallic iron that fell as a meteor on the surface of the Earth. And this actually was a big deal in Paleolithic, or actually in the, in the Bronze Age, um, because iron tools were way better than bronze tools. But you could only get them if you found a meteorite on the surface of the Earth. And so some of those were actually pretty big. Um, if they're, they're actually, because they have found tools made of meteoric iron, where you can tell based on the crystal structure of the iron that it came from a meteorite. Um, from from Eric, things as, as old as Bronze Age, before recorded history in parts of the world, like um, where we've since found impact sites of different meteorites. And so basically they would build up some of the earliest cities were basically walling off this iron meteorite from other hunter-gatherer tribes to basically keep it for themselves. Um, My meteorite. And, so, and it's... It's really cool. They were like, this is the level of technology they had. Like, uh, well, ignore that staple there that's there. Just keep that here because this was a historical find. Uh, but this is a reconstruction of what it would have looked like. They use uh, rawhide wrapped around a piece of wood. And then they had found this axe blade that was made of meteoric iron. Um, and it's, it's pretty, it's really cool to think about the fact that being a hunter-gatherer tribe, finding this thing come down from the heavens um, in this giant impact crater that they probably didn't recognize as the impact crater. Exactly. This is why so many of the earliest cultures, um, sky gods were the most important god of the pantheons, um, which is really fascinating to me. Anyway, uh, let's end there for today. And we'll do some word problems and some other so we'll talk about coordination compounds on Thursday. Do you think that, like, like how we can't create, like, the carbon, you know, it's because, like, we shouldn't be stuff, like, if we have those, like... <laughs> I don't tend to see technologies as inherently good or bad. I think that there's uses for all technology that is both good and bad. So I don't know that it's a we shouldn't. Um, I think that 